Guys, I'm Nathan with Duck River Honey. I'm here with Corey Stevens, who is a VSH queen breeder. That's Varroa Sensitive Hygienic, which is a it's basically a mite tolerance mechanism. Resistance. Mite resistance yeah. mechanism in honeybees. Mm -hmm. And you've been at this for 10 or 12 or 15 years now. Yeah, a solid decade okay. with VSH. So you've got a population here where you are artificially inseminating, you are selecting yes. for uh, mite resistance. Yep. And your primary selection criteria or testing criteria has been the Harbo assay. Correct. <laughs> and I did a video with you, when was that, a month or a month and a half? Two I think ago? it was uh, mid-April, okay. wasn't it? All right, so basically you take a frame, you have to pull a hundred cappings off, pull the brood out. At it's least gotta 100. be yeah, it's gotta yeah. be after purple eye stage. Mm -hmm. So the bees have had a chance to uh, the mites have had a chance to reproduce and the bees have had a chance to, to remove correct those yeah. reproductive mites. And uh, it's very time consuming. That's the, the key. It's Indeed. tedious. That's if, why I call friends. If if you would <laughs> you It'll be fine. You could pay me enough to do Harbo assays for a while. But then the but money then, wouldn't matter. But then yeah. I would burn out and go insane. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. I could not do it. It's super <laughs> tedious. So this is why Kara Wagner, am I saying that right? That's Kara, right. Yes. Kara right, Wagner is here. You are developing uh, UBO, which is unhealthy brood odor. That's correct. And this is an odor that the bees pick up on that simulates unhealthy brood that's right and we think it is testing for the same mechanisms or traits within the bees that you've been breeding for for a long time right. at least there's overlap there's, there's, a, lot, overlap. Yeah. there's a lot so of overlap we see that the that this is an unhealthy brood pheromone so it's essentially these pheromones that are elevated in unhealthy brood Mm -hmm. And we, when we, we see a colony that's responsive to those in terms of uncapping and hygienic removal, um, responsive to this pheromone mixture is also uh, resistant to mites. So they have fewer mite colony, mites in the colony. Okay. Now, this is the key for me is real world application. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not a scientist. I'm a beekeeper. So real world, op real world application. Uh, there were five of us here when we did the Harbo assays. Mm -hmm. It took all day to do 30 frames. Mm -hmm. and did we pull that day or did we pull the day before? We pulled that day. Okay, we were pulling gotcha. that morning and then we tested the afternoon. It took okay. all day yep, yep. Uh, with five people to do 30 frames. You guys with what? Three, three of us. With three of you. Mm -hmm tested 30 frames in four hours yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't even start till after one or 1 p.m. or yeah. so. We so, can usually knock out 60 or 70 colonies with two of us if we're if we're moving. Yeah, mm -hmm. and having a good time and chatting too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the process is very different. You're testing in the field, you've got an applicator with a spray, mm -hmm. and That's you're right. using a little piece of PVC. You put it down on the frame, on the brood, and spray it. That's correct. And then put it back in the colony and you're actually testing the bees themselves to see if they react to this scent. Right, so we give them two hours and we see what they can do in two hours in terms of uncapping. Sometimes if they're crazy bees like uh, Corey's here, <laughs> they'll start pulling them out too, but usually we just see um, uncapping behavior if they're responsive to the, to the pheromones. Okay, so it's a far faster testing methodology than doing Harbo assays. Right. Now, you told me something very encouraging mm -hmm. yesterday. And of course, this is not scientific, but you said it's not scientific because it's not peer reviewed and you know it's early data, uh, that sort of thing. But you said that yesterday, the testing that you did yesterday, you haven't been anywhere that had as many high performers as this bee yard. Right, so um, Corey's bees tested about 50% scored high, 50% of the colony scored high. Um, what is a high score? High score is 60% or above manipulation of those cells that were treated with the pheromones. Okay. Um, medium, we usually say, is about 40% to 59%. Um, and he had 33% tested medium. So, I mean, overall, these bees are just scoring really high on, on UBO, um, which makes sense because we think that UBO is probably uh, pretty strongly correlated with mm -hmm. the SH. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but that's what that's what we're here to determine is how correlated those two traits are. What what percentage in other apiaries that you've tested this in test high? 
Um, well, it depends what they've been, if they've been selecting at all. Um, typically, if they haven't been selecting, we may see 3-4% test high. Um, if they've been doing a little selection, maybe based on freeze kill brood, um, we may see 10% high, but 50% uh, is pretty unprecedented. So does freeze killed brood uh, test for the same thing as unhealthy brood odor? It doesn't test for the same thing. They're correlated. Um, so, so we so see if they... So dead brood and sick brood are two different things? They're different things, yeah. So, okay. I mean, you can imagine a, a dead brood is... The stimulus is increasing. Yeah. The stinkier, the mm -hmm. the longer the brood's been dead, the stinkier it gets. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's actually from a chemical standpoint, that's a different compound that the bees are responding to than um, this more subtle compound that's released when the bee's still alive but unhealthy. Um, and so I think uh, you definitely see some overlap in terms of the ability of those adults to detect a smell that's not wanted, um, but there's some specificity that's that's different between freeze kill brood, pen kill, uh, UBO, and, and other methods for selection. It, it makes sense to me. My wife will hand me a gallon of milk and say, does this smell funny? And uh, you know, it, it's sort of like that. So like, you're a high If UBO. the milk is rotten, <laughs> If the milk is rotten, anybody's going to get rid of it. But yeah. if it's just starting to get a little sour, right. you might think... Ah, Depends on your sensitivity, right? I don't know. Just call it a probiotic. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably not scientifically. All right, so, so, so the bees that score high are dumping the milk down the drain as soon yeah. as it starts smelling high e e at any point. At any rate, so. would you say That's low right. threshold low of threshold. detection? Basically? Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the the major benefit of that biologically is that they're getting that sick individual out of there before it's really able to spread the disease. Yeah. Right. So proactive. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. it's yeah it's helping prevent the spread instead of you know coming in with a treatment in August um, a, a mite mm -hmm. treatment in August which is knocking out mites when the viruses are already. All over the They're place. already walking dead. Now, this yeah. is another key. This is a key point that I want to cover. So the Harbo assay has to test in the presence of mites. Yes. You you have to at least be doing IPM, where if a hive needs to be treated, it gets treated. But you have to have untreated hives to what? to test with the Harbo assay, or at least a mite load. Like if you tested, or if you cleaned all your mites up you can get a false positive yeah because it looks like your bees did that but that so, was amateur so if oxalic. you're treating every july or august you need to do your harbo assays right, right before, before you, you do that exactly treatment. when your mite loads are at yeah. the highest because it gives you a more definitive result because you're technically measuring the bees ability to suppress mite reproduction yeah. you're quantifying reproductives and non-reproductives and then scoring accordingly what's so, the earliest you can test for harbo when do you, well when that's the thing season? we do ours in uh, in April, but I'd never treated the year before, so I would assume right. they're still they're still there. So he, he runs there. an untreated apiary. So for he, research yeah. purposes, I do yeah. not promote people just taking their hands off the wheel and praying. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you might hit a pole. So, but that, that, this this is the key point that I'm trying to make. UBO is going to test even in a treated colony. Yes, like you can right. you can clean Absolutely. them up in August and yes. do your UBO test right after. Because it is testing the bees, it is not testing for the presence of Correct. mites. Right. Yes. We do recommend testing in spring to midsummer, so we tend to see that the um, the hygiene level of colonies drops in the late summer and really? early fall. So I I think that's probably biological that they have other priorities uh, that time of the year. They're trying to actually build up their population for winter uh, wintering approach. It could be things like uh, nectar flow. So we have still some experiments that we're running to see, you know, what's the effect of nectar flow. Um, we know sometimes that even use of a smoker can impact the ability of them to, to smell. And a, a research paper actually came out and said, you know, use of a smoker can reduce their ability to smell for 20 minutes. I will say too, I think there's a lot of potential um, with other, other problems in the hive too. Um, because what we've, we've, 
You know, I've been developing this for years, but in the last couple of years, I've actually started to get it out to beekeepers and breeders and, and have them send me data back, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, and we're starting to get evidence from different breeders that, um, you know, the high scoring UBO colonies also have lower chalk brood. Yes. They have lower nosema, they have lower other diseases. So, you know, Varroa is the biggest problem, that's the focus, but this isn't just about Varroa, it's about healthy bees bees that can detect unhealthy bees, get those out, and keep their colonies healthier overall. Host resistant. So, so. so on average, will you see, on average, will you see lower mite loads in hives that test high on UBO? Yes, significantly. So can you use a primary and a secondary testing methodology? Primary being something like a mite wash, or forcing a mite drop with OAV onto a screen bottom board to find your lower uh, mite number hives and then just spend the money to do the testing on those to select your breeders from. Yeah, I mean, so when I select breeders, I would choose the best colonies for other reasons. Exactly. Okay. So, yeah. you know, choose your honey producers, choose, choose the ones that have a big healthy population and then test within that smaller group, which ones are the most hygienic and, and breed from there. Yes. Um, mite washes are great. Looking at mites is always important, but um, you can have a super hygienic colony that raids a mite bomb, a you know, that's collapsing. Totally. And they yeah. get full of, uh, of mites on adults yep. that are gonna show up in your mite count. Yep. Well, once those mites move into the brood, if it's a hygienic colony, they're probably gonna Just pull them, them out. out. Mm -hmm. But you're still gonna see that higher mite load when they're on adults. So you gotta yes. be, that, that, it's that an is indication, why, but you gotta be careful. That's why I said on average. On average, yes. right. Because I know mite bombs happen, and I know that if you're using that primary secondary testing methodology, you're going to kick some hygienic colonies out because of that reason, but I right. don't think it would be the majority of them. Right, but you could have, there are other mechanisms of rural resistance, right? So yeah, you swarming. could have a groomer colony mm -hmm. um, that's, it's not hygienic at all, but they're pulling them off adults, so yep. you get a low mite wash. You yeah. could also have a swarmy colony that had a brood break. Right. And, you know, you could be selecting four colonies that swarm excessively. Right, but on average, we've seen that correlation. So okay. if, if you if you see a high UBO score, you'll typically see a low mite count. So that could be a useful tool, but you've got to know what you're doing to use it. Right, not black and white like we said Exactly, before. yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, I think um, breeding has just been overlooked for a long time in honeybees. Most livestock cattle, I mean, that's a huge part of cattle breeding. Uh, cattle rearing yeah. is breeding. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I think we just need to get away from the chemical dependence mm -hmm. on miticides if we can. If we can have you got to use them it. if you need them. Right. Fair. Um, but it's nice to to be able to have some genetic stock that's resistant and, and maybe doesn't need them that can be healthy all along. And um, we talked about too how, you know, yeah, some of them are that test really high aren't as productive, but we know that we've seen it super high productive commercially viable bees that are very resistant which makes makes me go nuts but it's possible right and so with this tool it's going to be not a maybe not even just possible but the norm i hope after a while well, because it, it becomes economically feasible to yeah. do the testing and it, do the work I to think do it's the breeding econo not only economically feasible i think not doing this is economically infeasible for long-term pollinator the whole the whole food system is based on pollination yeah. so it's far deeper than just the bottom line of beekeepers like you and I, it goes way deeper than that. So it's it's a game changer. And it's like any other breeding effort. You can't ignore all the other important traits. This is one important exactly. trait. Yep. But you got to have them, you know, building up. You got to have them producing honey. Mm -hmm. um, and all those things are possible together. This is just one tool to help you find this trait. Mm -hmm. You've been field trialing this and it is going to come to market. Yeah, that's the plan. So I've been I've been working on this for uh, years now. It started out as a PhD project, and um, we realized kind of at the end of my PhD that we had something worth investigating. Um, and so we've now started a company. We're working to bring it to the market, hopefully by next spring um, or early next summer. What's um, the company name? The company is Optera. 
Can you spell that? Um, o p t e r a. It's from Hymenoptera. Okay. Um, which is I the like scientific that. name mm -hmm. of uh, of the social insects. So. I'm on your wait list. Excellent. You probably didn't know that, but I'm on your wait list. Um, How do people get on that wait list? On their web, on her website. I would, I would recommend they do because yeah. it gives them an idea of what they need to produce. And so if you're really interested in this, you know, preference on breeders and people that are going to use the data to further it. But how do you? Yeah, so it's opterabeefs.com and you can sign up. It's, it's non-binding, um, mm -hmm. but it just gives us an idea of who's interested, where you're located. Um, and uh, the people that sign up for a pre-order will actually get first dibs when we bring it out. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. do, do you have any idea of what the costing is going to look like? We know that um, it should be under $20 a test. Um, we're not exactly sure what the exact figure will be yet, um, but we're, we're getting there. We're working on uh, sourcing all the raw materials right now, so we should be there soon. Okay, now a test is per colony. A test is per colony. Okay, That's so right. under $20 per colony. Right. Um, and scale, of course, will change. Mm-hmm costing quite a bit I exactly would say. yeah so, so right now um, we're we're getting our compounds made in the university it's all for R&D um, but we're we're just talking to the the chemical companies we're gonna get it uh, produced on a massive scale and that'll bring the cost down significantly well and but, I hope that it you know ultimately I think it will be a money saver I'm hoping that that breeders can produce better queens mm -hmm. that last longer you don't have to buy as many queens each year you don't have to buy new new packages each year because your queens are surviving yep. your bees are healthier your bees are more productive um, and and you're not having to treat as often so and those queens will probably fetch a higher price if they've been selected for right. that too well, so that, it's mutually beneficial that's your angle ends. and that's also mm -hmm. my angle yeah well if you, you can't make money it's just for funsies <coughs> for a while it's not sustainable if you can make money at it and scale it that's that's a game changer. Yeah. You know? Yeah. If you're trying to sell a differentiated product in Queens, absolutely. You can sell. Well, I've got purebred Caucasians, or right. I've got Which purebred is cool. yeah. this or that. Different. But yeah. if you can show and prove that your bees are selected for right. mite resistance, which is the biggest problem in Sheet. honeybees. Absolutely. And, all, and has been since the late yeah. 80s. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Or that is the earlier. biggest problem. And yeah. if you can prove that, you're going to command a right. higher price. Well, then you can have UBO-tested Caucasians. You can yeah. have UBO-tested Carniel and UBO-tested Italians. You've changed your wording here since we were I have. talking about yeah. this. We well, were she asked me. We, we were supposing loaded. and, and yeah. wondering if this was going to yes. correlate or not. And well, your results yesterday. Have, definitely. Um, and, and I mean, she asked me a loaded question yesterday, or, yeah, yesterday about VSH, and I backpedaled. <laughs> <laughs> I said... I said, my thoughts have changed. What, but what that's did, learning. What, what if you she, can't look at solid data and not change your thinking, what did she you're ask you? you can't just leave that hanging. It was, what was the question exactly? I, I asked you your prediction about the correlation between UBO and VSH. Is that what you're talking about? No, there was a different one. Yes, I like that one too. But you were asking basically, was it strictly hygienic or was there a quote unquote brood effect too? Right. And at first, like I used to say, it's strictly hygienic. And now, because the brood's giving cues too, so of course it's more complex than we originally thought. Right. And that my views on that have changed a lot of because of her work and what she's found out too. And just, you know, but I try to keep my mind open. I want to be data driven and see where it goes. I don't right. Know. That was the question. Yeah. Is, is VSH driven just by hygiene? Right. right. Exactly. That's what you asked me. response of the adults. Right. I don't know that I'm well educated enough to know the significance of this. I do know that if you don't know what you're selecting for, you're never going to get yeah. it. So is that the significance of it? Does it, why does it matter if it's a hygienic function or if it's a brood odor function? Just to understand it better, I think. Yeah, so, so we know that um, fr from some previous studies I've done, we know that there are differences in the signaling ability of the brood, mm -hmm. and there are differences in the detecting ability of those signals in the adults. Okay. Right? So, <laughs> you know, it'd be great if we could just say, okay, we only want to select for the brood that's really good at signaling, um, and then the adults don't even have to be sensitive, the, the brood that are, and that's how it works with Apis serrana, right? Apis serrana, which is resistant to Varroa, 
the brood, when they are infested with varroa, they just die. Is that they're ap super apoptosis. susceptible, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The the apoptosis. Yeah. So they're super susceptible to varroa on the individual brood level, and that gives them resistance at the colony level. <laughs> There's a great paper that came out on that uh, by Page, and so um, with this method, I mean, it's just it's very difficult. It's very expensive to run the chemistry equipment that's needed to test for chemical signals. Mm -hmm. That's how all this started. But so what we're, what we're doing here, instead of testing for that signaling ability and susceptibility of the brood, is to test for the, the ability of the adults to smell. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. And we're just going with the practical route, you know, what's cheapest, what's easiest, yes. yep. what's fastest. Right. Well, that's interesting. So th I guess the, the pinnacle of selection would be finding colonies that produce brood that Signal. make the smell excessively and breeding for adult bees that pick up that it's like a cell phone reception thing if you've got a you know one of the old bag phones with a three-foot antenna and you're right next to a tower then you've got a strong signal and you've got strong reception it's kind of right. it's kind of working like that yeah, and I mean, I think you only need one. Um, I think if you had brood that signaled if it was a little bit sick, that may not necessarily be good. You know, maybe in some cases it's important to have... It, it might be too have much. not a great immune system, but they got something, mm -hmm. right? There's a possibility that they, if they're a little bit sick, they can overcome it. They can still be a functioning member of the colony. Um, and so, you know, I'd be careful not to select. I, I wouldn't want all my bees to have a little bit of virus to, to die immediately. Yeah. yeah. Um, or to signal to, to trigger removal. Um, but I think we can control from the, the ability of the adults to smell, we can tr control um, how good we want them to be at that. You know, if you start to see colonies that are removing everything that's healthy, Not you good. back up. <laughs> yeah. You know, you back up. A little too high. And that's the nice Every... thing of having a scale of zero to a hundred. Exactly. You know, if yeah. you start seeing all your hundred percenters are overreacting, you can back off. We haven't seen that yet. Mm -hmm. um, but you can you can over select for a trait, but that's the nice thing of having this scale is we mm -hmm. can we can kind of narrow in on what works. So what would you consider a breeder? Would it be one that's sixty percent or or above? You gotta ask the breeder that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it depends on your scenario. Like I'm obsessive over it, so yeah, I'd want them to be as high as humanly possible because what? I sell virgins too, so they're gonna outcross immediately. Right. Have you? Has she <clears throat> tested any of your AI breeders? Yeah, I called one Jack the Ripper. That was like the first one, one or two that we opened up. She's like, oh my gosh. I'm like, <laughs> what, what is what, that good? <laughs> what did that one test? Uh, it was close uh, to 100, maybe a 98 yeah. or so. 98 percent. Yeah, yeah and they I mean, it, removed it pretty a lot much of... destroyed those cells. Yeah. yeah. So, so it was opening up the cells and pulling brood out within right. two hours. Right. Oh, okay. But we may find breeders that don't have a high test because I have a lot of diversity in there, so I've got to sift through it too carefully without losing all my diversity. So that's a balancing act. What are you looking for when you're placing that? So I'm looking for an area that doesn't have. Um, you know, a lot of uncapped cells. It doesn't have any that are um, capped, but have been partially uncapped. Um, so I typically you're just looking for solid brood. Solid brood. I usually want to have at least one that's open, um, just to help me orient the pictures later okay. on. And um, does it matter brood age? Okay. We go for uh, purple eye or younger. They can be a little older than purple eye, um, but for some reason we don't know exactly why yet. Um, when they're within a day or two of emergence, when we spray it on, it actually kind of triggers an early emergence. And that can just mess up your counts. So you don't want to think that they're hygienic, but really just all those those bees emerged on their own. Okay. Um, so to test purple eye, you just uncap a few cells with a hive tool and... Yeah, you can check if you need if to. I mean, there's nothing emerging around here. And I can see some younger brood around, so, so yep. I know they're young enough. Um, but if you're not sure, you can always just uncap a few and check. You gave three squirts there. That's right. And, there's... and you can see it looks a little bit wet. That'll just evaporate off um, within about 20 seconds. And You'll you were see. telling me earlier that you're doing those sque three squirts 
at an interval because there's hexane in the spray and it will melt the wax. Yeah, it dissolves the wax. So if you put it on too quickly, you're going to start to see some of the cells uncapping as that wax just kind of dissolves. Yeah, so, so you just so space it out. So we wait 5-10 out. seconds in between each spray, let it off gas a little bit, let it, let it evaporate. And um, we actually use this PVC pipe to give it a little ring because once it dries up, you won't be able to tell anything's happened yeah. there if you don't have the ring. So you got to be able to, to know where to come back and check two hours later. Okay. So you're taking a picture. Yeah, I take a picture of it before. And then a picture and I, after. And then a picture after. And then I can just go back, line the two pictures up side by side, count the capped before and the capped after. And the key to that is you're doing the, the counting in the air conditioning. That's right. <laughs> yeah, without a veil over my eyes, yeah, right? Yeah, because it's going to be 92 today. It is, yeah. It's, it's, we had a breeze yesterday. It seems like we got a little bit of one today, so. Yeah. yeah but it, it is nice to take it in and, you know, you can do the counts real quick. Plug them in the Excel sheet and, yeah. and it pops out. You have that formula in there. It just pops out the score, so. So the key is you've got to keep the frames numbered. You've got to have, is, is it better to have your hives numbered, I'm assuming? Yeah. And Corey does. He's got all of his hives with tree, tree tags. tags. Yeah, I like to put it on the bottom board because if you move boxes around or whatever, yeah. that gets screwy, but the bottom board is like a foundation, so mm -hmm. to speak, and so I number those. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, and then I just mark the frame with the number, the colony number up top, so that we know which frame to pull back out two hours later. Just makes it easier to... Corey and I were talking about the time of year to do this, that if you do it, like, july through august maybe september then you're not going to be rearing queens until the following spring and you're probably going to have some supersedure or some death over Maybe winter results could potentially be so would early spring be the sensible time to invest and, yeah, and do this early spring is, if you're a breeder early spring is a good idea And we have had a few that were... Where is it? I don't know, this one may be a low score. But it's good to have both. Kara was kind of freaked out at first because oh, there it is. There it is. So that one's a, oh, they have started. See, they did some started removal some. and they perforated, but it, this one was is probably a, I would say, lower score, but she would be, be able to tell us a lot more. But yeah, see, they've completely removed that one. They didn't just uncap it. They're already taking it apart. But a lot of them, you know, majority of it's taken out. I don't see it on that side. But it's right there. Look, they're all over it. I don't see much activity on that one, though. Just shake them. You can shake them hard with that thing. That's on the edge there with it. Yeah. Let's see, where did she? Where's the ring at? That's a good question. I think it's right in here. Yeah, there yeah, it is. Yeah, I see it. So see the indentation. Oh, that's a good one. We've seen that a lot gonna better. Score. That one's okay. We've seen some, well, that first first run and that one breeder that I've been really sending a lot of queens out of, she completely shredded it. But like Kara said, she's like, I'm glad you have some low ones or else you wouldn't need <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's gonna be that may be a hundred percent right this there. Might be 100 cool. Check that out. Yeah. Let me see yours, Corey. You can see, look at the bees working it here. Yeah. That's Not cool. Bad. So I use a, uh, a whiteboard just to help me keep track in my photo uh, book of, of which colony matches which which picture. Well, it looks like a winner there. And then just 195. 
<laughs> yeah, you got 112. Without there, counting, what would you estimate that at? Uh, 90 plus percent? 100. 100? <laughs> so this Twin Viewer app lets you pull up your pictures and your your um, writing down the date, the apiary location. Yeah. Uh, T2 for time two. Time two, two, two hours, and then the colony number, and then you can see your picture of your whiteboard followed by the picture of the start and the picture of the finish, and then you can count that. So we just count the capped initial and then the capped final. Um, and this comparing them just shows you, you know, this one you don't count as uncapped because it was already yeah, it was already uncapped. uncapped. That's interesting. Not great. Good. Messy. Uh -huh. I know. This one probably uh, maybe 50, 60 percent. Yeah. So you can see there's several in there that are still capped. Still have so that's either a medium cap. or a high. Yeah, somewhere around that that cut off between medium and high. Cool. Looks pretty good. Yeah. And that one, see, look at the uncappy on it too. Yeah. Same backside too. Yeah, so, I got it here. Okay. Hey, Ray, have you seen a correlation between score and survival in an untreated population? Yeah. So I did. Um, I published a little bit on that. We had a pretty small sample size um, because. I can't always get beekeepers who want to just let a bunch of their colonies die untreated. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we saw um, significantly higher survivor um, survival in, in the high UBO than the low UBO. So we six, also, 60%, 60% above? Yeah, with a 60% or above. I'll, I'll say we also saw higher survival in the high freeze kill brood colonies. Mm -hmm. compared to the low but the difference wasn't as big so we saw more okay. we saw better survival in the high ubo than we saw in the high free skill group that's awesome um, and we we actually saw that reflected in mite loads too so varroa numbers were also lower in the high free skill brood colonies but they weren't as low as in the high UBO, UBO mm -hmm. colonies. yeah very cool so it's like you do and i think that's why you get that you get differing results, differing reports from freeze kill brood, mm -hmm. is because it was like right at that threshold. We had um, with the high freeze kill brood, we saw like in August about three percent infestation on adults, mm -hmm. awesome. um, compared to six or seven percent on the the low freeze kill brood. But with UBO, low. it was like below two percent and above seven was the difference. So it just it, it enables you to differentiate a little bit better was that it on the other side right there yeah but you can't don't see the ring but they're damn everything's gone i mean they pulled yeah, down everything. they shredded Let it wow. See that. wow that's pretty cool they let you know where the ring is even without seeing the ring <laughs> yeah <laughs> what's it, which one's a big up circle next? of empty, empty cells are the cells themselves empty yeah, yeah, yeah they've yeah, already they've, pulled the brood pulled out. Them out and chucked it out they were serious about this yeah, one yeah they weren't playing games Wow. <clears throat> That's a nuke. Gotta fit in the back of my truck easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised it's not in there already. Or I can't find that hive. Don't know where this frame came from. 